And I will be calling on everybody to unite behind the nominee. Got you correctly. You talk a lot about unity and coming Donald Trump. I, I wish it was not a vape. You can't campaign by divide. I want you to know there's a lot of people in this race, but no one has come through where there was thuggery and violence. My phones were tapped by the by the city police. It was her very, very tough politics. The newbie was incredibly successful, won the Tribeca Film Festival, got nominated for an Oscar, and then lost to a movie <laughs> called March of the Dagnab Penguins. <laughs> I learned very well that I am not cuter than a penguin. <laughs> Flightless rodents. I love animals. <laughs> but that movie will show you that I had to fight my way against the, one of the toughest, most vicious machines that was out there, and that I did not lose my integrity or my dignity. In fact, I believe my theory, and again, I know there's some fight fire with fire people out there, and God bless them. If they become the nominee, I'm behind them. But I'm willing to die on this hill because I believe that when we as Between Americans January. extend grace to each other, we're not weaker, we're stronger. That when campaigns are aspirational and call all Americans to join together, that reach out to independents, that reach out to Republicans because they're suffering with the opioid crisis, inadequate health care, uh, 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 starved public education, they're suffering too. And so my call of my campaign will be to unify people because unity is strength. And, and I hope that you will give me a chance to earn your, your vote on that. Thank you. All right. I, I was, uh, Jill, please. And then I'll go, then I'll go back again. Uh, my name is Jill Marshall. I grew up in Plainfield, New Hampshire. I left 20 years ago, and I worked on Capitol Hill for another senator, Tom Daschle. Yes. He worked very hard for rural Americans. Yes. I'm wondering what your plan is for rural Americans. Thank you. So her question, because the microphone didn't get to her in time, is what is my plan for rural Americans? And number one is we are going to have, if I'm president of the United States, a massive rural infrastructure plan. As I've traveled from rural Iowa to rural New Hampshire, I'm stunned from the water quality issues to no access to broadband. We need to have a rural investment to make sure that the infrastructure is there so people can build communities. Number two is we need to have investment in rural areas. I've already passed probably the biggest rural investment bill there is called Opportunity zones where every single uh, um, governor, and they've already done it here in New Hampshire as well, can designate 20% of their lowest income places. As we look across the map in America, some of them are urban places like Camden, New Jersey, but many of them are rural area, areas. I've met with Heflin, Alabama leaders who are telling me already our legislation, which gives incredible tax incentives to people to invest, is going to create hundreds of jobs in their community. And that's one thing we have to get investment back, and I'll double down on doing those things. Number three, Rural education is critical. And right now, a lot of kids don't have great educational pathways. If you have a rural school, for example, you are really struggling because the federal government, for example, does not fulfill its share of special needs funding. So if you have a few special needs kids, beautiful children, that by law you have to provide full funding for, often those schools now have real challenges. If, the, if we as a federal government just funded special needs education fully at the 40% level we're supposed to, and that would be money for rural education, which is really important. Rural teachers, we, we have a situation where a lot of teachers can't afford even to go to rural communities. The salaries are too low and they're carrying too much debt. I'm going to have the most ambitious program, not only for forgiving the debt of teachers, but also giving them the kind of tax benefit. It's obnoxiously offensive to me that teachers have a tax treatment that is worse in ter than, than Wall Street stockbrokers, and we need to correct that balance. So I am very focused on rural America, and a lot of it's because of the, of, of the question that Kate asked. We need to be a party that has a rural agenda. And the last thing I'm going to say, to the, Sam, to your question, we are killing American farmers right now. We're ending the independent family farm as we know it in America because we're allowing unchecked corporate consolidation to drive our farmers out of business. That tomato or broccoli you buy at the co-op here, it is the, the consumer, the share of that consumer dollar for farmers is down about 50%. And so I was with my favorite farmer in the Senate, a guy named Tester. Uh, um, he and I represent the largest girth in all of the Senate. We're very large people. And, and he and I were just talking. He's a farmer himself. We've got to stop what's happening in ag and start having agricultural policies that support the independent family farmer and fix a broken food system that's really suffering because of all this corporate consolidation in the ag world. All right. I'm going to go. 
There was, I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to go to the gentleman back there, okay? Yep, yes, you. But we're going to go here first. Your daughter was born, in your, was born with light upon her. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, an educational researcher, and I, did, I was doing research on underserved communities across America. I've been in many, many states. And the Newark schools, it was, I, I had my, being a New Yorker, my image of Newark was a little, and, and I went into the Newark schools. They were the best schools that, I, that were in the study. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. I will not uh, object to that statement at okay. all. And, um, and I'm devastated about Betsy DeVos and everything that she's doing. Um, so I'm not going to ask you an educational question because I know where I know I trust you. But um, to follow up on the question from the young woman who asked about your supporting the Democratic nominee, should you become the nominee, how will you deal with Donald Trump as an, as a, as an opponent because of the way he fights and the way he and the, and just the tactics that he used? How, how will you be the candidate to beat Donald Trump? Right. So remember, the opposite of justice is often not injustice. It's apathy, inaction, and indifference. We as Democrats have all the votes we need to win just about every office, but too often we're not engaging people to get into the process. I know Pennsylvania, I was just in Philly a few days ago, and they were talking if, if Philadelphia alone got 7,000 more votes more, and there was a lot of people, tens of thousands that didn't vote in Philadelphia alone, if they had 7,000 more votes, she would have won that state. The same thing with Wayne County, where Detroit is, if they had just got activated their base. So the first part is getting our own base excited and energized to get out and fight. And I believe that if we do that, number one, and get, get our base of voters, we're going to win. But that's not enough for me. Because I really do we have, believe we have a message for the rest of America. I was with some union heads the other day who told me 50% of union members in some of their unions were voting for Donald Trump, which is unbelievable. Here's a party that is attacking unions like never before, attacking Davis-Bacon, forcing states uh, uh, to, to right to work, become right to work states. Union America is on its knees because of Republican policies. And I want to make sure that we're reaching out to rural communities, to our union brothers and sisters, and let them know that we are the party for them and we have an agenda for them in their lives. And then the final thing I will say, because people ask me this all the time. I got asked by this by some uh, a snarky uh, a reporter one time. Corey, you talk about loving people all the time. Um, 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 or do you love Donald Trump? And I, and I just basically said, look, I, I'm my mom taught Sunday school, okay? And, and, and she taught me to love my enemies. And I'm not going to let anybody drag me so low as to contort my soul and make me hate them. But I'm also a former football player for Stanford University. You put me on the field, and you will have no stronger and harder fighter than I am. And I'm going to prove that in this state by going all over, working from early in the morning to late at night. I will fight for us. I will fight for kids in struggling public schools. I'll fight for people with inadequate health care. It's what I've done all my life. It's why I live in a tough inner city, because I'm going to stand with you and fight for you. And if I'm your nominee, I'm going to fight, and we are going to win. All right? The gentleman. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Will Tansky. I'm from Grantham. And an issue that's really important to me is gay rights. But um, we're, we live in like a pretty mixed area, so there are some of the kindest people you've ever, you've ever met that are like really staunchly conservative. So I'm just wondering what your opinions are on balancing religious freedom with gay rights and that agenda. I, I don't see how the two are in any way opposed to each other. You know, as an African-American, and my parents and grandparents told me stories that people used to use religion as an excuse to discriminate against a second-class citizenship for African-Americans. And people stood up and just said, wait a minute, that, that should not be. We should have laws to protect against discrimination. The freedom of religion, believe what you want, but we should not have a country that allows any minority to be discriminated against. And so I believe fully in religious freedom. I was in South Carolina meeting with a whole bunch of black pastors. I grew up in a black church, and they asked me the similar question. And I said, look, I belong to Metropolitan Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey, and my pastor is not going to do any gay marriages in his church. And the government should never force him to. It's his church. And, and I might be one of those parishioners that wants to talk to him every once in a while about these issues. But this is where we are in America right now. 
30% of gay and lesbian youth report not going to school because of fear. And we have Betsy DeVos and the Education Department rolling back protections for LGBTQ kids, kids. If you look at homeless youth, overwhelmingly the significant part of them are gay and lesbian youth. We now have violence against gay and lesbians in this country that just as we see an increase in homophobia, uh, excuse me, an increase in Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, we're also seeing an increase in attacks. And tr the trans community, my brother's child is transgender. The, the kind of discrimination that they're enduring and violence and murder of trans Americans is unacceptable to me. And so I believe in equal rights. That's why yesterday, a bill that I originally cold sponsored, we had day before yesterday, excuse me, we had a big, a big, big uh, a press conference pushing again something called the Equality Act. Now, what's the Equality Act? Most Americans don't 